think people have slowly started coming in, so uh, let's get started. So, my name is Kasper Lank, and uh, while on my t-shirt, I'll be saying differently, I'm from a company now called CP, uh, not Sipper. Uh, we quite recently we renamed away from this because of some trademark uh, trouble, and it's not an experience I can rec recommend from any, for anybody. Especially after you already have, already have uh, produced t-shirts and all the swag, um, so yeah. Um, so what I'm here to talk to you to, about today is CP, uh, which is essentially an open source out of box experience uh, for the blockchain and the decentralized internet. So a little bit about myself and CP. So um, previously I was working in a company called Jola. Uh, which is making a mobile operating system called Sailfish OS, uh, which you'll be hearing a bit about later today. Um, I quit in about 2016, I was uh, CTO of the company, because I want to pursue the angle of uh, how could you combine blockchain and mobile. Uh, it's a Hong Kong company, uh, but in practice, as most companies are today, it's distributed. We have people in the UK, in Finland, a couple of guys in the US, uh, some people sitting in the Hong Kong offices and basically around the, all around the world. And um, we, kind of, we, we raised around, let's say, 50 million US dollars uh, in order to kind of pursue this angle. And if you want to, let's say, visit our website, you can visit cp.org. So, one of the things we kind of went through in our renaming exercise was first off, we had to find a new name. And uh, back in the 90s, there was a movie called The Cities, which was kind of like a New age kind of hippie who embraced chaos theory, the chaos theory, uh, Blake and Revolt, modern mysteries uh, such as new age paganism, French music, rave culture, smart drinks, free software, technology, and entrepreneurialism uh, in an effort to bring about a better world. So, with a little bit of corrections, that's pretty much what we try to do in our company. So, before I get started. How many of you actually know what blockchain is in this room? Just hands up. Okay. How many of you actually understand how it works? Okay, I don't fully understand how it works either, but uh, one of the things that I would like to do is, instead of talking about the technology, I would like to talk about, let's say, the characteristics of, the, uh, characteristics of it. So, if you try to kind of talk about the technology first, people don't always get to what it can actually be used for. Like, for example, let's say that somebody started introducing the concept of a bicycle um, to you before actually seeing what you can actually use it for, it would not be a very good description about uh, uh, understanding what it can actually do. So, let's start with what blockchain is not. It's not a very efficient database. Uh, in fact, it's pretty much downright terrible for that purpose. Uh, a good description would kind of be that it's kind of like a multiplayer spreadsheet uh, with access controls about on who and uh, on how or what can change the context of certain fields, along with let's say a history of what the contents used to were in the past, uh, what the contents were in the past, and what transactions made the content change. In such a way, you can kind of compare this a little bit to let's say a court. So. What a court system essentially produces is the consensus about what reality is in a particular, uh, but the reality of facts are in a particular jurisdiction. You get court filings in, disputes, they get settled according to certain laws, contract terms, and so on. And transactions to kind of uh, change the consensus on a blockchain is quite much similar. They get evaluated according, according to the terms deployed into the blockchain and allowed to, let's say, uh, change the consensus according to these rules. But instead of, let's say, being a court of humans, like, which is the way that uh, things are done today, uh, it is it, it, that a court of humans that evaluates, let's say, Swedish laws and language, it's a computational court that interprets code and computes transactions that uh, interacts with it. And that code, kind of like, let's say, embedded procedures in a database is called smart contracts, uh, which it's a terrible name as well because they're not actually, let's say, legal contracts in the in traditional sense of the word. And instead of, let's say, treating it like a database, uh, when you're interacting on a blockchain, you shouldn't attempt to treat it as a database, you should treat it like court, as in you don't really want to go to court for every single thing that you do. Uh, you try to postpone it, create constructions around it, so you actually only have to uh, 
send things to court, uh, let's say, because you need to establish a change of sentence, for example, now somebody else owns my house, or if you get into a dispute where it has to be clarified what is actually the, the fact of things. So, another characteristic of blockchain is the such that unless you have significant computing power, let's say, bigger than the contributor power, uh, bigger than 51% of the contributor power to the blockchain network, it's really difficult to say fake or tamper uh, with the consensus of the, and the history of it. And if they do, you as a, let's say, a client of a blockchain that connects to the network can also quite easily notice something's not going to exactly right. And the last characteristic that uh, all the nodes of a blockchain essentially share the same state and validate the transactions done on that blockchain. So one of the kind of effects that you end up with is that a blockchain can end up being, let's say, um, computational, trusted third party, uh, where, let's say, you don't need human third parties such as court or uh, other middlemen that exist today, uh, because basically if it can be computed or, let's say, otherwise proven to the blockchain and the nodes that are processing the transactions, it can be a replacement of the protocol for a human third party today. Okay, so... Let's just introduce a little bit about, let's say, what cryptocurrencies are. So, imagine an insane world uh, by which the way that you pay somebody is go to court, submit a court filing along with a bit of uh, funds for the court to actually process this, that a particular amount of the coins that you own now belongs to some other party and sign this particular court filing. And eventually the court uh, comes along with a confirmation that, well, now your filing has been accepted to the registry and you can then go ahead and, let's say, ask the court how many uh, coins do I own at the moment. Uh, and in addition to that, you can also, let's say, uh, co-create together with the court in order to, let's say, maintain the in in integrity of their registry uh, and by that earn, let's say, more funds. And that's essentially what Bitcoin is. Um, the traditional cryptocurrency. Instead of having, let's say, a handwritten signature in ink, like you would on a court filing, uh, you would use a digital signature, like public key, signature, signing, etc. And instead of a paper form that you would submit to a court, you would generate a data structure stating basically that I transfer X of my coins to the person who can sign a transaction with the uh, public key that hashes to Y, where Y is essentially what is a Bitcoin address and well, X is some amount of Bitcoins. And similarly, in Bitcoin, you will be able to, say, earn uh, Bitcoins to uh, contribute computing power to the network in order to maintain the integrity of the registry. And that's basically a very typical uh, cryptocurrency where you're doing mining in order to uh, uh, keep it. But now imagine that you could have multiple of these kind of ledgers and transaction handling and kind of same model and you can deploy it for any kind of uh, coin or token model or whatever like that uh, with different properties on how you earn coins, for example. Let's say that you could uh, earn, for example, a couple of tokens for attending an open source co uh, conference like this, for example, or uh, contributing disk space to a network, etc. And essentially what you can make is uh, make and program your, let's say, your own kind of money uh, of different values with different properties, and this is basically what's called tokens. So, if we have, let's say, these amazing decentralized technologies today, so like blockchain and decentralized storage, peer-to-peer -peer networks, why aren't everybody using them yet, and, let's say, decentralizing away from companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook and Apple? And it's actually quite simple um, why that is. Using decentralized technology today is just way too hard for people. Um, on mobile devices, uh, that is actually even worse because when people are, let's say, developing blockchain uh, software or decentralized technologies, they're using, let's say, the high powered laptops or servers, etc. Instead of the things that what most of us are running around today doing mobile commerce and communicating with others, the things in our hands are mobile devices. And if you kind of want to compare with anything, uh, you can compare this means of getting started using the software to the good old days of setting jumpers, 
uh, on, on cards, uh, installing drivers, writing configs, uh, and basically se sacrificing several furry animals in order to appease the software gods. And the problem isn't just, let's say, the UX of the applications themselves, because even if you have, let's say, a good user experience for a decentralized technology, it's kind of worn down by the fact that you have to handle your own private keys uh, and a kind of general expectation by uh, many people that you have to maintain Swiss bank like security, um, basically. And what we really kind of believe at SIPI is that it should basically be as easy uh, to start using this as having a Google account and pressing play uh, on Netflix to play a movie. So, as I was kind of mentioning before, you can't really understand what a bicycle is and its use cases by, let's say, seeing a description of the components that it's made from. So, I'll, I'll try to uh, demonstrate this kind of sample flow. I was originally going to make a demo, but um, the software gods were not very happy with, uh, with me this morning. So, what I had gotten working yesterday <coughs> did not work today, and that's just how it is. So, let's say that we have just met in a bar. I would like to share a little bit of tokens, some other data or information about uh, that who I am. So, for example, you can in the future contact me. I can show you a QR code. I can show you a QR code on my phone, and you can scan it uh, using, for example, a QR code reader or any other means, uh, even a base web based one. Well, you don't even need, you don't even need to get a, a, a mobile application for it today. And what is essentially pops up is since you're starting to use the SIPI thing. Uh, for the first time, it's basically, let's say, a startup wizard for this uh, stuff. And we ask you to confirm that you have uh, read and understood these terms, and if you actually understand the terms here, uh, you are way more better in the Latin than I am. And we then proceed to ask your email, phone number, and so on. Not so much for, let's say, spamming or anything like that, or sending your newsletters, but for basically checking if you're already, let's say, involved with uh, Zipper Identity. Uh, for example, it might be that you have already started using the system on, for example, your laptop or uh, phone or tablet, and basically we enable the means to connect these devices together. So. It feels a little bit like how you normally set up a Google account, even probably you guys have done it so long ago that you forgot how it's actually like, like. And that's basically it for setting up your, let's see, your de decentralized digital identity. So, let's say in the final version, we're doing alpha version now, it would be also suggested to, for example, add uh, CP to your home screen or your phone, and let's say to enable push notifications so you can get information related to your digital identity. And basically, you're ready to roll at that point and start using any of the different uh, decentralized applications. So, just to kind of iterate what has happened here in a very short time, you didn't have to actually install any applications in order to start using the decentralized environment. So, done your browser with a very, very quick setup. You are pretty much on board with the decentralized internet. Uh, you can use it simply as you would click a movie on Netflix and it begins playing. You have a digital identity that you can kind of secure further as you gain more value of, let's say, the stuff in, your, for example, a wallet or your data gains more value. And what we kind of do is trying to provide, let's say, a set of services and uh, APIs that make these decentralized applications, internet applications, able to. Um, have basic operating system services, finding out, for example, how do you access, access the different blockchain networks, how do you sign transactions, where to access or store particular content, and so on. So, while this might seem very simple, I just want to kind of look at what is the state of the art at the moment. So, uh, my, my kind of favorite example is there was a very nice decentralized social network. And the first thing it asked me to do was basically spend several hours downloading a particular blockchain to my disk and run a local blockchain node. And if you want to get anybody interested in decentralized technologies, the last thing you should do is ask them to wait for several hours before they can actually do what they want to do. Quite often it's such that uh, many of these solutions ask you, okay, so you should print a paper wallet, which is basically a QR code on encrypted form 
that you print out and you store them under the floorboards in your grandma's house. And several amounts of people at this point have already lost interest and they don't understand why they need to print uh, a paper wallet or, or, or write down 24 words, which is basically what can be generated into, let's say, um, at the base of, of a digital activity. In addition to that, most people don't understand the jargon and let's say new concepts that are in these digitalized things. They kind of take you away from the actual intent that they have, which is to actually use a decentralized application. It's quite often that applications ask you to download, for example, let's say an Ethereum node, which is a particular blockchain. You have to install a local IPFS software, um, which is not a thing I'll be talking about in a moment. You have to install a web extension and it basically becomes quite complicated compared to how you normally expect things to work in a nice smooth way on a mobile device. And in the end you kind of get recommended, okay, so you need to get a, let's say, a hardware wallet instead, which is basically an external security chip. So, I just want to kind of show some basic examples about how things look today. So, this is very typical onboarding for uh, starting to use a typical uh, decentralized application. You have to go to a Chrome store. Uh, and what many people don't, uh, don't know is that in China, Chrome store is blocked, so no blockchain for the people in China, for example. Um, you have to deal with a lot of scary things like uh, what the, this extension can do with your, your device, and you're kind of like, no, we're not really convinced that this is something that maintain, to maintain your privacy. Um, adding to the fact that they talk about better software, then you get asked to write down 12 words um, and copy it somewhere safe, and People are not really that good at that. And then you get a very, very confusing UX after that, how you actually deal with stuff. And it's also possible for them to get these things called hardware wallets, which is things you stick into your USB port. And uh, if you're using mobile devices, it's not really an option either. Um, you might have to print paper wallets, like I was talking about, um, which is basically when you scan this with a QR code to read them, you don't get anything particularly useful out of this. Like you would kind of expect it. You would kind of expect these things would be popping up. Beautiful UI uh, that would be showing how to handle the funds, particularly in this uh, paper wallet. Um, and the middle one is a typical uh, Ethereum blockchain node, which it has some degree of UX, but it's pretty clear that it was an engineer who designed the UX. So. You have just, let's say, seen a glimpse of what SIPI is like, but I kind of like to draw a little bit of bits and why we're doing things the way we're doing uh, from our uh, not yet release software. <coughs> so, one of the things we believe is that uh, everything in everything that comes down to how we uh, deal with, let's say, decentralized applications basically surrounds you with your digital self as in your digital identity. Uh, we also believe that it's basically possible to do, let's say, pro progressive and practical security that even, let's say, your grandfather can understand. And uh, that it's possible, let's say, to use incentives uh, such as tokens in order to, let's say, guide people towards uh, better security. And as I was mentioning before, I had previously been involved with a company that brought uh, mobile devices and operating systems to market, so we very much know uh, how hard it is to um, bring a product into the hands of consumers. And this is a really, really important thing if we want to, let's say, decentralize away from existing services like Google, Facebook, Apple, etc. Um, because you really don't have a lot of time to convince people of the utility or benefit of what you're doing with your decentralized application if you get into basically that they get overwhelmed with what they have to do. And we also believe that it's let's say, not about, let's say, the technology such as blockchain, but instead about uh, the interactions and, let's say, removal of friction between all of us that it actually enables. And secondly, so, you've probably read in many newspapers there's a bit of a craze about uh, cryptocurrency and uh, big investment possibilities and so on, and it, it's actually not all about the money, to be honest. If we are kind of like to say uh, leverage the full potential of blockchain um, 
the possibility to, let's say, replace several middlemen in our societies with, let's say, computational ones. Um, we can't really ask, uh, ask everybody to, let's say, both understand the technology in depth and maintain, let's say, a vigilant Swiss bank uh, security-like approach at all times. It really has to fit into the digital lives that uh, people already lead. It, it's basically all a matter of uh, degrees of security that's matching, let's say, the value and uh, our data that you're trying to keep. Uh, basically, that five dollars uh, requires less security than, let's say, five thousand dollars do. And you can also see this with, for example, uh, contactless visa cards now today. That at least in Poland, where I'm living, that uh, up to a certain amount you don't have to use your PIN code, for example. You kind of rely on that everything just goes fine onto a certain amount. Now, let's get into the technical part a little bit. So. Uh, CP kind of has this key component called Vault. Uh, if anybody of you uh, have worked in a better than mobile devices, you know that many devices have basically security chips or hardware security modules, which has very simple operations like generating a key, assigning with a key, encrypting, decrypting something, uh, get the public key of this uh, of this particular key, uh, while let's say the actual private key is stored inside the chip and you can't. Uh, get at any yeah, how hard even how hard you want, and this is essentially what this wall component uh, provides for let's say web based applications. So, um, what your let's say CP digital identity is is basically let's say a master seed, which is used to generate separate but de deterministically derived security context, as in um, an own set of keys for every single uh, application website that uses it, and. But instead of, let's say, storing the master seed on every device, it's kind of split into pieces and uh, uh, stored separately. So it's possible to, let's say, if you lose your uh, mobile phone, then it's possible to cut it off like you would cut off a credit card in case that gets stolen. And only when you actually need to do, in, let's say, signing or uh, operations, or if you need to decrypt something or you need to have a new security context, uh, for example, because you need to start using a new distributed application, uh, then the master C is temporarily put together but never stored as such on the device. And another feature of this vault is that essentially a uh, website can kind of get signed statements from it saying that this other website that you're talking to is actually the website that uh, you, you they say they are, for example. So you kind of end up having Intercommunication web intercommunicating web applications uh, that can talk to each other essentially, and uh, all of this code code basically runs in the user's browser. It's on complete client side. We don't maintain servers related to this that uh, you have to communicate with. We store don't store your keys, and each of you only fetch basically the code once uh, from our website at this point, or you can run it locally if you really like to. Another, let's say, key technology used in SIPI is something we call IPFS. Um, it's not made by us, but we're quite heavy users of it. And what essentially it is, is a content address network. So, uh, the traditional way of doing things on the web at the moment is that you ask for a particular file on a particular path from a particular host. And on something like IPFS, what you do is instead you ask for the hash of the data. Uh, instead, and it fetches uh, this data down to you, you know, say a BitTorrent-like manner. And the interesting thing about IPFS is that you can also run in completely inside a, a web browser using technologies like, for example, a WebRTC to connect to other nodes on the peer-to-peer -peer nodes on the network. Um, and you can access and communicate with them in, the, in that way. And I've seen some really interesting use cases based on this, such as, for example, uh, collaborative editing, like let's say Etherpad like or uh, Google Docs like, um, which basically connects different uh, people on this peer to peer network together and basically editing without any middlemen in the middle in, in practice. Um, IPFS also has a couple of other uh, interesting functionalities, like something called IPNS. Uh, it's the ability, let's say, um, to have a, let's say, a registry of particular public keys and an associated value. And if you want to update the value, this, the private key corresponding to this public key will then go ahead and basically 
uh, sign a new update to this value. So you end up with this kind of uh, almost a decentralized key value system where, let's say, instead of updating your website by uploading new files uh, to a particular uh, host, instead you will basically submit a site update matching the new hash of your website uh, to this particular public key where it can then be fetched at. And as a kind of last functionality is this uh, pop sub, pop sub ability. Basically, you can publish messages across the IPFS network towards a particular topic and subscribe for these topics. Uh, so basically, you can end up having a little bit of a, a decentralized, uh, for example, chat or otherwise communication uh, possibility. And these are very useful if you want to, let's say, build true distributed applications. So. Then let's say that you're writing an application. So how do you make a CP app? You basically start out with a typical uh, PWA, which is uh, uh, progressive web applications. Uh, you make basically static files. They run entirely in the browser. Uh, then, then you go ahead and basically deploy this to something like IPFS. Um, you don't then go ahead and uh, interact with the CP APIs. Uh, you get told, is this user already since they signed up or not at this point? Um, you might want to show a button, for example, or you just want to go right ahead and, and ask the user to sign up in order to use the application. Um, then it might be that you get asked, okay, so we need, just need to go one turn around in order to kind of authenticate that you're actually the application that you are. And the end result is basically that in order to start using the applications, a person just needs to know the hash of your application, which is the code. Uh, and start using it immediately, and uh, it's it's pretty much like on Netflix. Like let's say you knew uh, a particular hash or a name of a movie, and you just start using it. That's it. No need to download anything. And if you want, you can basically ask the user to also add you to your home screen, kind of bypassing the traditional uh, app store uh, limitations. Well, we are currently doing this in the browser, we have some ideas also how you could, let's say, integrate something like SIPA, uh, CP, damn it, um, uh, into devices. So, for example, uh, you could have the security features uh, hosted in a container running alongside Android. Okay, it's completely separate, so even if Android is, uh, let's say, attacked, uh, you're then never going to get access to the factory private keys, for example. It would be possible to, let's say, enable tighter integration into something like application grids and similar to how you would, let's say, have a Google account on, a, on an Android device, uh, you can instead have a CP account, which is a decentralized identity that doesn't, let's say, belong to anybody except for yourself. And we would also be, let's say, able to do, for example, secure display overlays for example, in case you want to, let's say, plug in particular PIN uh, codes, etc., etc and uh, also enable, let's say, the, the deep notification, like you're for example using fingerprint readers or other biometric devices on the device. And that's basically it. So um, we are currently working hard towards our product alpha, which is uh, should be coming at the end of this month if everything goes well, and a um, lot of marketing around that as well. And we'll also be publishing a source code at this point, which will be, let's say, traditional open source licensed. And if you want to know more, uh, you can either ask questions just right afterwards now, or access our website, or our Telegram, or Twitter account, or even look at the code if you want to. Thanks a lot, Carson, for your talk. I thought it was really interesting. So, do we have any questions? I see someone in the front. Great speech. Um, so, how is uh, Zippy? Or is it Zipper? Or CP. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, how are you planning to make uh, money? What is your business? Yeah, model? so, um, there's a couple of different models here. Uh, so, we believe that if you manage to get, let's say, the decentralized internet and these different use cases around blockchain easy to approach. It also opens up the possibilities for a lot of different businesses on top. We have some things in works, uh, which I can't talk about at the moment, uh, which is one business case on top of it. But um, similar to something like Android, um, that there will be business cases on top of it, many different possibilities and probably 
it's not just going to be us doing that, but also different companies that we might also let's say invest a little bit of money into, and basically uh, earning from them. But there's also an element of that. There's uh, a so-called CP token, uh, which we'll be using to also incentivize users and also grow the ecosystem. So there's different ways for the company to also make money for this, but for now we are settled at least for a little while. Uh, hello, is CPN or uh, ERC20 token? Uh, it's an ERC20 token, yes. Okay, uh, then I have another question. So Bitcoin ha has been having a lot of problems with the scalability due to the blockchain getting bigger due mm -hmm. to Bitcoin Cash. Do you think Ethereum will have the same problem because more, more stuff are being stored in the blockchain and then it makes it harder to host it? Yeah, so the, the, the problem at the moment with scalability in blockchain is that people try, try to use it as a database while well, you have basically seen it's not a database or not a very good database. There are many interesting uh, things going on for something called Plasma in, uh, in, for Indian Ethereum where basically you uh, enable the ability to hold, a, let's say, a ledger and people that are participating in this system can then go ahead and dispute if there's something that doesn't look correct. So it's kind of like uh, uh, being able to um, notice that, okay, now I just got a, got a post about this and suddenly my house belongs to somebody else and I, well, I haven't signed off on this. So I would go ahead and basically dispute on the blockchain instead, for example, that, um, well, this transaction can't be true, for example. So there's many different uh, scaling possibilities possible at the moment. Uh, but uh, it might very well be that the real impact of something like SIPA is not necessarily currency, but in other use cases instead. Mm -hmm. um, so, can you give me some examples of applications to, that could be developed? I don't want to ruin your business model, but like, because I've only heard about uh, cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. and I don't know, like, it's a bit hard for me to follow, like, uh, your idea, like, of apps, because I have a hard time imagining what kind of applications can be built. Okay, um, so the question was, uh, what kind of applications you can build as a on top of something? Uh, let's make a sim very, very, very simple example. Why do I have to today uh, to share pictures of my children with my family to go through Facebook? If I, let's say, knew the public keys of uh, uh, or the CP identity of my family members, all I would have to do is to basically provide uh, uh, some files stored in something like IPFS. Uh, Perhaps an encryption key, a decryption key that can do to actually do, start to use it, and basically you would have a shared space between me and my family members where you can access the files. Very, very basic decentralized technology. You don't need Facebook for that. Um, but in terms of blockchain, uh, I can just recommend there's several books that deal with these topics uh, and uh, have, have potentials. But uh, one of them kind of interesting is also, for example, let's say in supply chain tracing, etc. But there's many, many, many different use cases. And the problem is that while there's thousands of use cases for this at the moment, uh, they all stop at the point that it's super hard to get into this stuff. So it's also aimed for us, and we also have our kind of mission, to make it easy for people to start doing this, because then we can see the real innovation happening on top of it. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask about Vault. Um, mm -hmm. You said it was client side, which sounds uh, great. I'm just wondering if I have multiple devices, can I keep it in sync between multiple yeah. devices? So the question is, if you have uh, multiple devices, if your digital identity is kept in sync, yes, uh, that's the general idea because essentially, if you have a, this master seed, uh, out from that you can derive, let's say, infinite layers of keys underneath. So if you go to let's say yahoo.com on uh, one of your devices, it starts using the same uh, private and public keys on this device because they share the same master seed. And uh, that way they can get it keep synchronized quite easily. Now if you have to look at something like a file system, it can becomes a little more complicated, but uh, there's essentially some data structures um, called uh, CDTs, which enable basically 
to synchronize uh, different objects together across multiple devices in, let's say, eventual consistency form. So uh, the aim is to have something that's synchronized probably across your devices. What I'd like to get to is that I can take an axe on stage and put it to my mobile phone and quite immediately afterwards start using another device with the same stuff without having had to upload my unencrypted data to cloud providers. Yeah, that, that, was, that was actually the kind of use case I was thinking about, or if I lose my device on a bus or something like that. Mm. Yeah, so that, that's basically it, that uh, we enable also different recovery methods and so on on top of that, including for example social recovery. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Um, so you also mentioned it in the introduction that uh, one of the risks uh, is that there might be some uh, some party who has maybe a lot of money who buys many many nodes uh, and like uh, plays uh, how to say unfairly with the system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are there any kind of workarounds or ways to prevent that? Because I like. It's also a problem that happens in the real world, like when someone has a lot of money, he can like buy people or people opinions, um, but generally like people, most people have a dignity, so it's uh, hard, it can be hard to buy them, but like if it's talking about machines and computers, the more money you have, like that directly translates to a bigger number of nodes, so is there any, any ways or any ideas maybe at the current state to prevent that? Um, so there's, uh, the, the, the problem is always a, it's an economic problem. So while many blockchains at the moment are using something called proof of work, where basically you're buying computing power, there's also some blockchains moving to something called proof of stake. As in when you, uh, let's say, uh, cheat or uh, uh, do something, uh, let's say that that that's bad for the integrity of the, the blockchain, for example, then is that you lose your deposit, essentially. Kind of like if you uh, rent a car and uh, you would turn it into a completely broken form. And that is also, let's say, a little more ecological than something like uh, proof of work, where basically you are using computing power and electricity, which is really usually made by not so good for the climate things either. So. It, it, it is an economic thing, but it also should be an eco economic incentive uh, to not uh, cheat these things. And a second question for me. Um, excuse my ignorance if I'm saying something stupid. But when it comes to blockchain stuff, everybody is ignorant in some way. It's so so new. I have lost track of quite a lot of things. Okay, thank you for being so kind. Um, so how does open source fit in all this? Why do you go open source? Is it so for other people to verify that your claims are correct? Or how does it fit in? Yeah, so, so maybe I can just talk about this from a, let's say, a philosophical point of view. Uh, nowadays, my mobile device, for all intents and purposes, it's part of me. <laughs> it contains my memories, it contains my, quite a lot of, let's say, the personal abilities I have. So, let's say that eventually we get to this point where we put uh, computers into our brains as implants. Why the hell would you want to uh, run something in your head that you can't read? As in, how about you would not be able to understand. Open source really matters a lot because, especially when you're dealing with, let's say, people's money, they have to be able to verify that this is actually something that uh, is not going to screw them all and, let's say, send a few cents once in a while to the hacker or uh, in other way, other ways compromise you and it really has an additional uh, requirement of security as well. So open source is really important in order for people to understand that these smart contracts and blockchains, they're not uh, cheating you. They're not going to, uh, it's something you can actually trust. Okay. So, once again, thanks, Carson. Yeah, if there's any questions, you can always reach out to me.